Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The behavior of the chief priests after the resurrection of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 is so cynical, so unredeemable, and so pathetic that the only bearable quality of the story is that in the victory of Jesus, the author gives us a little space to laugh. But here's the rub. If you've been listening carefully, especially those of you who are like me, a priest and a religious leader, you should take care to laugh heartily because the joke is on you. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 426 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We will continue the theme this week of the problem with religious leaders, <laughs> because Matthew's continuing the theme. It's not because I have a bee at my bonnet. I mean, for heaven's sake, people, I'm a religious leader. I'm critiquing myself. I hope I'm not this bad, but since I'm reading Matthew, I must be this bad in some way, shape, or form. But these guys just exploited the Romans they hate to receive news of the movement of the gospel they were trying to prevent from getting out. <laughs> the same guys who bribed one of Jesus' close associates and then wanted to keep their hands clean by throwing him under the bus and saying, we can't touch the blood money that we provided. <laughs> See to it yourself. They're back at it. <laughs> I hate to laugh, but it's so bad, it's funny. And it's so funny, it's not funny. You can allow yourself to laugh at this point in the Gospel of Matthew because Jesus has bested them. So now it does become comical because they're exposed as complete frauds. And they're desperate to make Jesus look like a fraud, but they are clearly exposed as the fraud. And that's what this passage in Matthew, this section, is all about. It's about the fraud of religion. It's about the fraud of the things that human beings manufacture to project their image of themselves onto the heavens. I was watching a program about Inspiration4 on Netflix. And honestly, Richard, I'm at a point in my life where I can't watch that stuff anymore. Because they exploit people to justify themselves. They did some big donation to a hospital and did some big marketing story about how wonderful it is that they're helping children to cover up their sin that they're spending bajillions of dollars on space exploration while there are still people sleeping under the bridge in every city in America. So it was a feel-good movie about how great they are and what an inspiration their billionaire ship commander is. I mean, it's really ridiculous. But ultimately, what it's about is the Tower of Babel. And one of the engineers told one of the crew members, look up tonight, because tomorrow you'll be looking down. If that doesn't sum up 
the sin of the Tower of Babel, nothing does. Because man wanted to go up above the heavens to look down. You can't do that in Genesis. This is not a statement against space exploration. I am a huge science enthusiast. It is a statement against marketing, against self-justification, against the exploitation of other people's suffering to make you look good, to justify your billionaire program. That is the fraud of the temple made by the hand of man or the building, any building made by the hand of man. The left hand need not know what the right hand is doing, and according to the Sermon on the Mount, must not know by command, by divine writ. Let not the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So by all means, donate $200 billion to cancer research for children. Just don't make your movie about rocket ships a commercial about your good deed because then you're shutting everybody out of the kingdom, beginning with the little one you exploited to promote your agenda. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. <laughs> you can't get out of this mud, Rich. It's the same thing over and over again. Yeah, when we think about from last time, the situation that everybody was in where we had the chief priest who didn't know what was going on and these soldiers coming with this news which was the worst news that the chief priests were thinking could have happened and very unlikely also we also know the track record of the chief priests up to this point they're the ones that trumped up charges against jesus by finding false witnesses and grooming false witnesses they're the ones who managed to find the money to give to Judas to betray Jesus, but somehow couldn't find any teaching that might console someone who'd done such a wicked thing. Now, a lot of times when people read about these wicked church leaders, religious leaders, they think, boy, we want to make sure we're not like them. Oh boy, as long as we're not like them, we definitely don't want to be giving money to perpetuate lies. That'd be a really bad thing. But you said earlier, Father, that this is not to prescribe a way to be or not to be a good religious leader. This is a judgment against these religious leaders who are willing to do anything to, as you said, Father, keep the program going, justify their program. Dang, if, if people find out about this Jesus that he rose from the dead, that what he had to say, as nutty as it was, actually came true, our program sunk. What are we going to do? Well, we can't sink the program, that's for sure. Okay, then what comes next? Well, this makes perfect sense. If you take the assumption that we have to save the program, this makes perfect sense, actually. Make sure that the people who saw something lie. As long as they lie, then we can keep the program up. Now, the program, sure, it's based on a lie. I mean, not that we don't see that happening, you know, this very day, you know, people being put in prison for telling truths. We have a teaching that cannot stand if the program is going to stand. This is what happens when the kingdom that Matthew is here to announce comes to bear. When this kingdom comes to bear, when this king comes to rule, the other programs need to step aside. Not just the high priest's program, but even the Romans' program, even Caesar's program needs to step aside in the face of this one who comes, whose feet walk to carry the good news, to carry the gospel to those brethren who might be willing to listen and obey his father. So they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. This was their concern all along. That's why they installed the guards, the custodians. And when their fear, which was actually a hope, didn't come true, now they have to manufacture it. So who is the fraud? 
This is the last sin becoming worse than the first. It's being fulfilled. It's being portrayed before your eyes in the gospel. This is the point. The fraud of religion after the resurrection is much worse than the fraud of religion before the resurrection. Because if you still believe in all this nonsense after Jesus accomplished what he did under the order of his father, then there's no hope for you. Even if someone should be raised from the dead, they won't believe. Remember that teaching. Memorize it. And recite it to yourself in the mirror. Because it is the gospel's truth. These are men, the educated, trained practitioners of wisdom. The professional people, that's what happens when you take a paycheck to deliver wisdom. You reinvest a portion to make sure that the actual person delivering wisdom for free doesn't ever see the light of day because it's bad for business. This is the fraud. And now they know for a fact that Jesus is the real deal. And they're still willing to cut a check to save their business. It's a story. They're characters in the text, and I feel embarrassed for them, Rich. Bearing false witness is the program for the chief priests. That is what their accusation was based on. That is what their explanation is based on. I like how you brought this together, Father, where you said their fear was that the disciples would lie saying he rose from the dead, so we need to lock down the body. Then the body went missing, and now they have to pay the soldiers to lie. They were worried about the disciples lying. Now they have to make sure that the soldiers lie. They're not against lies. They're against those who would compete with their program. They want their program to stay alive, and they'll do anything. They'll manufacture the data that's necessary. They'll manufacture the stories they need. They'll hire the marketing consultants who are able to deliver the message with the most beautiful sound to it. They're going to convince all the naysayers. This is the only way to compete against the kingdom the kingdom of the heavens. The kingdom of the heavens is based on truth in this way. These are the lies, the false witnesses that they have to perpetuate if they have any hope. But they don't have hope. They tried to trick Jesus. It didn't work. They tried to trick other people to say something false about Jesus, and it didn't help. And finally, they tried to lie to the soldiers, and we'll see if it's going to help or not. Hint, it's not going to help. I'm thankful to the Gospel of Matthew for giving us the license to laugh here. Otherwise, it would just be an unbearable story. Simply by having Jesus greet the women and speak to them, and then presenting us with these keystone cops, the chief priests, Matthew is giving you license to laugh. And the sad thing is that Jesus is rushing to preach, 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 preach the truth— the women are rushing to preach, 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 preach the truth. And it's important that they are women because motherhood is the expression of God's mercy in the Bible. We've said that many times. I hope it's sinking in finally. And these religious leaders are rushing with as much zeal and equal zeal to suppress the truth. And they're willing to fund lies that's the ultimate blasphemy. You can't go further than that. You can't go further than being completely aware that Jesus was raised by God the Father <laughs> and then literally going on a campaign to make sure nobody knows. It doesn't get worse than that. I want everyone hearing the podcast to understand that's as bad as it gets. That is as cynical as it gets. And that is how Scripture views industry it's how Scripture views human construction. It's how Scripture views everything man builds by his own hand. 
It's how Scripture views everything we value. And it is trying to pull away from all of that to lead us back to the wilderness at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. That is the cycle. That is the gift of the remnant. You have a few people left to give birth, and we begin again in the wilderness. And God, who is merciful, doesn't give up on us that we will remain sheep in his flock and not wander back in to the city and try to resurrect the line of Cain. It's as simple as that. But there are four Gospels, and there is a much longer story from Genesis to Revelation that we have to keep hearing over and over again every year, so I'm pretty sure that the writers of Scripture knew that we weren't going to listen, Rich. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. Look, they're talking like true practitioners of real politic. We get all the angles figured out, guys. We've got your back. Don't worry. We've got the politicians in our pocket. Because as leaders of the church or leaders of the synagogue, the main thing is we have good relations with the local politicians. <laughs> I have nothing else to say about that verse except that, Rich. Yes, they definitely have the ear of the governor. The governor, for some reason, tends to believe the chief priests, which I either think the governor is very dim-witted for his position, or he benefits from the lies that the chief priests teach, because I'm guessing that they didn't start lying when it came to Judas. I'm assuming that they started lying long before this so that they could keep the program going. When they say, we're going to make you secure, Amerimnus. Amerimnus comes from the word a, ah, meaning the negative, and then merimna. That means anxious or care. So literally, we'll make you relaxed. Don't worry, we're going to make you relaxed. They know how to make the governor relax. They know how to make the soldiers relax. They've got it all covered. The only problem is, is that Jesus was a thorn in their side, and they couldn't relax. They couldn't figure out that one, so we'll kill him. Don't worry. We know how to take care of this sort of business. We have lies that we can tell, and we have people whom we pay so that they are willing to hear them. So this strong contrast between the feet of those who are there to teach, to bring the gospel the ones who bring the teaching from heaven, the brothers who are hearing the word of their father and doing it, like we heard earlier in Matthew, the opposite is these ones who are founded completely on lies, who know other people willing to hear those lies. So it's the truth versus a lie at this point. Now, here's the thing. Truth and lie, I mean, this has become political nowadays. Truth is something that people I believe say, and lies are something people I don't trust say. This is how people use the words. In Russia, it's against the law to tell lies. That's the case. But what is the truth? That is set by a higher authority, and then a lie is something that goes against that authority. The authority in Matthew is the kingdom of heaven, beginning with, as you mentioned before, Father, the Sermon on the Mount. This is the word that's authoritative. This is the truth that's there. The human being who tries to reconcile the Constitution and the Gospel is only going to be able to do so by lying. They're in conflict with each other. As soon as you cover over that conflict, that tension, you are lying. And the way you lie is the same way that these people lie. You find people who are already willing to hear your lies. And the reason for lying is the same reason as these people. You want to keep the program going. So you must begin with Scripture and then weigh your constitution or your essay or your political ideology against Scripture. Scripture is the only reference point for what is true. Not your conception of Jesus, the feeling you have about Jesus in your heart, the words of Scripture that we hear when they are read. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. 
And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. This is a tragic verse. They took the money, so you paid the Gentiles, and the Gentiles did as they were instructed by the Jewish religious teachers. That word instruction, which is, of course, related to the word Torah, the word is the thasko, to teach, to instruct, but it's related to the word Torah, because Torah means instruction, teaching. So what are you teaching them? You're teaching them not to teach the Torah. You're teaching them to shut the Torah out. And that story, which is a lie, was spread widely among your own people while Jesus is spreading the story of God the Father, the Torah, among the Gentiles. So you succeeded in shutting your own people out of the kingdom, which is Paul's accusation in Galatians. That's the game people play to this day. Now, it's not about the historical Jewish people. You can't turn this into your anti-Semitism, your historicization. It's about anyone who hears this story. The minute you hear this story, you are judged as one of the villainous characters in the story which is all of the characters ultimately. It's literature. You can't historicize. And if you haven't figured that out, that this text is addressed to the Gentile church, that's the rub about this who moved the cheese metaphor. If the cheese has been moved and these women, ultimately Mary Magdalene represents the Gentile church, then this gospel is very hard on the Gentile church. Because if you've received this gospel, then it applies to you, then you're condemned by it. It has nothing to do with identity. Identity in the story has a value because identities are played off against each other as a functional judgment. But ultimately, as I said, he holds the whole world in his hand. Everybody, all of humanity, and the oneness of all of humanity that's the point of the three sons of Noah and the oneness of the three sons in the Old Testament. So come on. Just realize the tragedy of you succeeding at establishing your unity in the oneness of the identity of your religious group against the world. Good, you've succeeded. Your people hate the world and they love you. And because of that, they're not hearing what Jesus is saying. And then guess what? We have an Orthodox war in Eastern Europe. Yes, the ones who are hearing the lie, who want to continue the lie, who perpetuate the lie, are the ones who are aligned with these high priests. Those are the Jews we're talking about here. We're not talking about the Schwartzes who live in New York or something like that. That's not what we're talking about here. So I agree, Father. I don't want to go down the path of anti-Semitism. That's not what this is about. This is about those who are unfaithful to the word of the Father, who align themselves with religious leaders who lie. This is a judgment against the religious leaders in general and against their followers this is a very harsh treatment to those who are hearing these words. And one thing that your translation said, they perpetuated this story after they were taught it. But it's ologos. They were taught a word which they perpetuated. The soldiers are the anti-Marys. The Marys are here to teach the word of the resurrection that Jesus spoke to them about, that they heard from the angel. The soldiers heard the same angel speak, but they, instead of bumping into Jesus on the way to informing the disciples, went and ran to the high priest to tell them what happened so they could save their own behind. And in order to save their own behind, they were taught a false word that then they could perpetuate to others. So the Marys, who were very concerned about saving their own behinds before, they were the ones who were standing afar off. The soldiers were close by. Then in the end, the soldiers were the ones who skedaddled, and 
the women, the Marys, who got down to business in spreading the word of truth, the word that Jesus taught them, as opposed to this word that was taught to the soldiers by the high priests. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.